participant mark. Okay, we just crossed it. All right. Welcome everyone, uh, and thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Shai Adelson. I'm one of the founders of Fort Health. Uh, we are a mental health care practice providing care for children and families in New York and New Jersey, and we provide education sessions like these uh, for families all over the world. Uh, this webinar is part of an ongoing series of sessions that we are hosting in partnership with the Child Mind Institute. We do these pretty much every month. And every month we bring together clinical leaders from different organizations for a discussion about an important topic that affects the mental health and well-being of children and families. Now, our goal is to provide parents, educators, and primary care doctors with actionable advice based on clinical experience and evidence. Uh, this principle of action-oriented advice is especially important for this afternoon's topic. Uh, if you look at the CDC data, and you compare between 20 years ago and where we are today, there's been almost a 40% increase in the prevalence of ADHD diagnoses among children. And that's in the 20 years from 1998 to 2018. Now, unfortunately, the increase in awareness and available resources does not always lead to improved understanding of how exact is the support a child struggling with inattention and hyperactivity. Now, there's been over 6,500 of you who registered for this session, which tells me that many of you are looking for this kind of practical advice. So let's get started. Um, I'd like to welcome our three panelists here. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Matthew Beal, who is the Chair of Child Psychiatry at MedStar, Georgetown University Hospital, and also the Chief Medical Officer at Fort Health. We have Dr. Hel Kopovitz, who's the president, founder, and medical director of the Child Mind Institute, which is the leading nonprofit for pediatric mental health uh, in the US and a great partner of Fort Health since day one. And we have our guest uh, this month, Dr. David Sitt, who's a tenured professor at Baruch College at the University of New York. And in his clinical practice, Dr. Sitt specializes in treating ADHD, anxiety, mood disorders, He's on the clinical, uh, he's a clinical board advisor of Agave Health, which is the first virtual clinic for adult ADHD, also doing parent work. And finally, he literally wrote the book. Uh, he wrote uh, a best-selling book called ADHD Refocus, brings clarity to the chaos, and that's available. So um, if that's okay, uh, esteemed doctor, I'm just going to call you by your first names. That's going to make the conversation easier. Um, and today's session, we will do three things in three sections. We're gonna provide simple evidence-informed signs that you as parents should be looking for if you suspect your child struggles with inattention, hyperactivity. We're gonna share practical and proven tools that you can use every day to manage and help support your child, both at home and at school. And then we're gonna help you understand when and how to get more help and what kind of help is available. Someone asked on the questions, are there slides? No, they're not. We're trying to run this like a talk show, uh, sort of a, a round table. Uh, we think it makes the conversation flow better. So with that, um, let's get started. And Harold, let's, let's start with you, a very fundamental question. What signs of inattention and hyperactivity are common in early ages? So I think you have to remember that all kids have a lot of energy, we hope, and we're, are curious and they can move around more than certainly adults. And so one of the things we have to remember is that when we talk about ADHD and it's a clinical diagnosis, we're talking about children, no matter what age they are, that have significantly more hyperactivity or inattention or impulsivity than the other children their age. That's why, by the way, teachers are particularly good at um, giving mental health professionals information about those kids. Because if you are a kindergarten teacher and you've been doing it for 10 years, you know 250 kids really well. And parents, even if you have three or four kids, their sample size is very small. And psychiatrists and psychologists usually see kids when they're in trouble. So it's a somewhat uh, skewed sample. So I think we're talking about kids who seem to be over-energized, the motor is constantly running, um, they can't sit still, they seem to be in action all the time. Um, there's sometimes excessive talking, 
uh, trouble playing quietly, moving from one activity to another. And uh, they can have extreme impatience and trouble with what we call delayed gratification. So it's, it's very often, as soon as they hit kindergarten or first grade, uh, school makes you wait your turn. And these kids have a lot of trouble holding their comments, waiting their turn, lining up in, you know, to go outside, uh, raising their hand to go to the bathroom. The inattentive behavior is a little more uh, difficult to pick up. And there are versions of ADHD, high attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, that do not have hyperactivity. And for those kids, um, you're usually looking at kids who have a, a lot of mistakes because they're not careful. They have trouble with their focus. Um, they can get stuck by being overfocused. They they watch a video and you know you start to wonder has their hearing gone because you can't get them to detach from that activity. And so parents will sometimes say, "Well, he seems totally overfocused. What are you talking about?" But they can't transition easily, and they certainly have trouble hearing directions, uh, being able to follow two or three commands. So parents will say, "I don't understand. I told him to go brush his teeth." and to come downstairs. Well, they start brushing their teeth and they can get lost in the bathroom. Or I told them to go to their room and bring their backpack downstairs and they got lost in their bedroom by looking at stuff on their, on their desk or a book that they found interesting or a toy. So I, I think that, you know, we're talking about extreme cases where your grandmother can make the diagnosis, right? They're so energized. But nevertheless, we're looking at two other things that are important, and that's distress and dysfunction. So either the child is feeling so uncomfortable because they're being yelled at all the time. I, I can tell you that when I ask a six or seven-year-old boy, are you a good boy or a bad boy? Very often kids with ADHD will tell me they're bad boys uh, because everyone's yelling at them, telling them to do something else. Harold, sit down. Harold, get up. Harold, stop doing that. And the other part is dysfunction. Are they not doing as well at school or at home or even on the soccer field because they can't stay in the grid, they can't follow the directions? And that kind of dysfunction, are, as well as the distress, are the reasons parents usually come for help. Now, uh, David, do the signs change? And if so, how do they change later in adolescence and maybe even early adulthood? Yeah, there's, there's, you know, to, to, uh, to Harold's point, there is a um, kind of a spectrum of understanding these symptoms as they unfold. And this also holds true as uh, children grow up into uh, early adolescence and even further into young adult and adulthood. There, there really is kind of shifting waves that occur. And some things that I uh, kind of guide parents on looking out for is as children get older, you begin to see a kind of a opposing uh, a shift between how much structure exists in their life and, and as that structure weans off, symptoms kind of change in relationship to that structure. So as an adolescent gets older, we start to see more carelessness pick up because there are fewer perhaps teachers or other people guiding them in a structured way. So we see carelessness increase. We see organizational um, control begin to um, come undone even further as they get older. So they're required to be more independently organized, to pack their own uh, bags to go out to school, to make sure they're bringing their homework home uh, and having all the necessary items as they're getting in, into high school. So we also begin to see things such as uh, impulsivity, if that is part of the feature, as Harold said, they might just be inattentive, but if there is the hyperactive impulsive, we start to see um, more risky behaviors unfold as a as a child gets into adolescence, there's less structure. We're going to see more riskiness uh, occur. I also often see the impact in the social realm. So if a person, if, if, a, if an adolescent is struggling with controlling their impulsive behaviors or impulsive communications, we begin to see that affect their relationships with their friends. And that is an impact. Um, I would also add that because adolescents begin to notice what their friends are up to and how their friends are able to grasp, grasp material easier or focus longer. And they realize I'm not able to do that as well. That awareness begins to uh, affect an adolescent and, and uh, young adult uh, in ways that maybe we wouldn't have seen 
in those early childhood, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten year old years. Um, and the last thing I would uh, focus on here is in the the way emotions play out, the emotional dysregulation which can emerge, um, the 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 stress, the um, the feelings of uh, getting uh, frustrated easily, mood swings occurring more often in in, in young uh, boys and girls. We begin to see this more prominently as as uh, uh, they age up. I think also it's important to remember the environment changes. So parents are always surprised if their kid wasn't one of these energizer bunnies and they were really bright and they did well in elementary school because the teacher was an executive assistant and mom was the executive assistant. And then you go to middle school, which is just a prescription for disorganization because they do have to pack their bag. They have to go to their locker. And so all of a sudden, a kid who was doing just fine hits fifth grade and you know, you've know you taken away the guardrails. And so that's when the inattention really shows. And also the fact that they stop, they sometimes don't pick up social cues because right. they're just not, it's not that they have autism, it's just that they're all over the place. So they can't tell when someone's lost their patience with them. And just picking up on, on that too, Harold, you know, what Shai, Shai let us off by saying there's this enormous increase in ADHD over the last couple of generations. There are a lot of factors in that, but one of the factors is the way that school has changed. Um, and the fact that school has moved so much toward highly rigorous focus on test taking and on preparation for test taking, less time for physical activity, less time outside, less time with music and art. Those used to be daily activities in elementary school, and now they're one, once a week if you're lucky. Um, physical, physical education and physical activities have taken down quite a bit as well. So as, as the demands on children's executive function have gone up and up and up and up, we're seeing more and more kids presenting with symptoms of ADHD. I think David was referring to this. Shai, I hope you don't mind if I just pick up on the biology here. Let's do it. Uh, you know, ADHD is not like COVID. COVID, either you have it or you don't. You got the virus, you test positive for COVID, then you get rid of it and you no, you no longer have COVID. ADHD is not you have it or you don't. ADHD is more like blood pressure. Everybody has a blood pressure. And it's somewhere between 80s over 40s up to 180s over 140s. And for good reasons, doctors decided that a blood pressure around a 100 over 120 over 80 is about as high as you want it to be. Above that, it's going to start to cause health problems. We do the same thing with ADHD. Everybody is on a continuum of their ability to pay attention. The ability of the front part of their brain, the prefrontal cortex, to tell them what's important to pay attention to and what's important to ignore how to direct their attention, how to stay on top of the things they need to stay on top of, how to repress impulses that are gonna get them in trouble. Everyone is somewhere on a continuum from excellent attention to not very good attention, from excellent impulse control to not very good impulse control. And everyone falls somewhere on that, on that continuum and where we draw the line and say, this child has ADHD, this child doesn't, is based upon how it's affecting their life. And that changes, as David was saying, from childhood to adolescence to young adulthood, but how that those differences in brain development that affect the prefrontal cortex affect the child's life are determined by the child's environment, determined by how much is demanded of them at school, how much opportunity they have to move their body. It's determined by their parents at home because ADHD biologically is also highly inherited. It's a very, her a very highly heritable condition of heritability of 70 or even as high as 80%. Um, so when we see kids with ADHD, we oftentimes see that they're being brought to, their, to our offices by parents with ADHD. Um, and so having parents who have learned to manage their own lives and to manage their own ADHD symptoms, those, their kids tend to really thrive, whereas parents who may struggle more with their own executive function, their own organizational skills, their own attention, and as a result, they have difficulty transmitting how to develop those skills to their kids, we see symptoms more in their kids. And then finally, things like sleep and diet and exercise, we'll come back to those later, I think, Shai, all have a tremendous effect on all of our attention day by day. If any of us sleep three hours tonight rather than eight, our attention tomorrow is not going to be very good. And kids who are chronically underrested and underslept are going to have a worse attention span than kids who are getting a good night's sleep, irrespective of whether or not they have ADHD. Yeah. So Matt, I, could you talk a little more about genetics? Because if I was a parent listening, I would think, oh, is there a test? You could find a gene. So if you could talk about fraternal versus identical twins and how we in psychiatry know something is genetic. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank, thanks, Harold. So, so I, unfortunately, we don't have a gene test. And we don't have a gene test for most things in medicine, including most things in psychiatry. Um, what, we, what we know is that in, for many health conditions, 
there are tens or twenties or even hundreds of genes that are contributing to a condition. And that's true for ADHD as well. There are a number of genes that are related to ADHD that do pass from parent to child. Um, and we know that these conditions are th things like ADHD, like autism, like mood disorders, like anxiety. Many of the conditions that we see in child psychiatry have a highly genetic component because we know that there, if there are two twins who are identical twins who are raised in different environments, they're going to grow up to have very similar risk of developing these conditions later in life, which suggests that their shared genetics have a really strong influence on their long-term health outcomes. Now, it's not fate. It's not 100% determined, determined by genes. There are influences that, 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 are, that, are, um, that are made by environment, by parenting and by the home environment, by the school environment, and these, these other factors in kids' lives. But these, ADHD is among the most heritable conditions. And so I think that we tend to think about it in our clinics, and I know probably for you too, Harold and, and David, that we think about these as family conditions. And that, that if we're going to help kids, we need to help parents perhaps with their own ADHD symptoms, but also with how to be the best parent for a child who has ADHD, which really are a number of skills that can be acquired that, that I think we'll be talking about later, Shai. Mm -hmm. That's actually a pretty decent segue to go into um, action orientation here. So uh, this next session, we're, we're gonna get into uh, practical advice. So let's start from basically the mornings. So um, Harold, can you walk us through what is a simple morning routine that can help a child with uh, ADHD transition smoothly from the home to the school. We just woke up, what do we do? Well, let's go back to that wonderful word, routine. So, you know, parents know that their lives get simpler if there is routine. If they set the table the night before or they set their alarm 30 minutes or an hour before their kids wake up so they have time to exercise or stretch, that they can have a cup of coffee, and as we get older, we need these routines. And if we are disorganized, if we don't remember where we put our keys or where we put our wallet, that means it's going to be more difficult for us to get out in the morning. So if you have a child who has ADHD, um, the, the most important word there is routine and a set routine. And what you're hoping to do is teach really tools and skills that your kid will be able to use later on. Um, so you have to figure out um, particularly for young kids, you're going to wake them up. And you also have to understand, are, do they wake up easily? Are they get out of bed and they're raring to go? Or are they a slow waker-upper? And if whatever it is, you need to leave time for it. And you have to figure out, are you going to open the blinds? Are you going to turn on the lights? Are you going to try to be gentle with them and realize that that extra five minutes of being gentle with them and talking to them about a, you know what's coming up in the morning might be very time-saving or it might be a time sink. And so you have to figure out what you know with your kids. But I would suggest that parents set the clothes out the night before and get, hopefully, no matter how young your kid is, some approval on that set of clothing. Because the last thing you want is to start having an argument over the clothes. I don't like the color or the tag bothers me or I don't like those pants. So spending a few minutes on picking out what they're gonna wear the next day makes sense and having it out there. And by the way, setting it out in a really easy way that the underwear is separate and then the, sh then the socks, then the pants, then it, it sounds simplistic, but it really has to happen that way. Um, and it's the same thing for setting up, you know, brushing your teeth, washing your face. Um, I always suggest that, you know, for young kids, bath time is a great time at nighttime. It's very soothing. And that way you wake up in the morning and you know that's checked off. You don't have to do it. Um, and as the child gets older, you're able to give them some of these some of these tools, like an alarm clock that clearly shouldn't be within reach of the bed, and um, and sometimes two alarm clocks, so that they know that what they need to make them sure that they wake up uh, on time. I also think giving them warnings and saying this is a ten minute warning. Just want to give you you know some time management skills here. Five minutes, you know, this is a three minute warning. And also when they come down, you have to also understand 
what their appetite's like. And if they're taking medicine, most probably they're not going to take the medicine until after breakfast. So they should be somewhat hungry. So you have to have it organized. You know, uh, making complicated breakfasts in the morning might not be the trick. Having cereal pour ready and poured out, a nutrition, you know, some kind of protein bar that they like or breakfast bar, having a glass of milk there. Uh, as one, if someone's going to talk about diet, there's nothing wrong with putting chocolate in the, in the milk if that gets them to drink it. So the idea is that it's got a routine. You're checking off boxes of what's the priority, that they eat something in the morning so they have energy. And then if they're taking medicine, they take the medicine right after breakfast and you then put them in the car or on the bus or you start the walk to school. I also think that what you discuss with your kids in the morning is really important. That's not the time to ask them about their worries. Uh, it's to talk to them about what are they looking forward to in school? What's the exciting thing that's going to happen today in school that they want to talk about, whether it's a test, whether it's a game, whether it's seeing a friend, so that they go off to school with the most positive mindset that's possible. By the way, easier said than done. This could be, this could be, you know, and multiply it. We, you know, we had three sons and I have to tell you, you know, it was like a juggling act. But before we went to bed, my wife and I, a lot of this thing was set up. They, you know, we, we used to make jokes that even after the kids were left, we were setting the breakfast table up the night before and thinking like, why are we doing this? We barely eat breakfast, but it became part of our family's routine. All right. So if I summarize uh, three key words, number one, routine, number two, simplicity of said routine, and number three is move a lot of the preparation of that routine to when you're not under time pressure. As right. in, and and as I would in. even add one more thing. Mm -hmm. Catch your child being good. So mm -hmm. if they came down at the five minute warning or the three minute warning or they came down on time, you know, Shai, thank you so much for being on time. It makes me feel so good when we are partners like this and I know I can count on you. Instead of saying, Shai, are you deaf? How many times do I have to tell you to come downstairs? That's those are the 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 no's. Do not do that, especially as the kids going off to school. Here, I'm, I'm shy. I'm trying to pick up on some of the questions as we go. And there was a question related to what Harold was just saying about about oppositional defiant behavior and ADHD, and it reminds me of a, of a story that Harold probably told me of of a, of a child who 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 introduced himself as Stop at Brian. Um, because that's what his parents called him. He never heard them just call him Brian. It was always stop at Brian. And so when, when kids who have ADHD or, or are developing ADHD as young children, when every interaction they have with their parents and with other adults is negative, stop it, cut it out. You're being, as Harold said, you're a bad kid. Those interactions that are negative, 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 obviously fuel an attitude towards adults and other authority figures of defiance. It's very clear how that happens mechanistically. And so what Harold just said is so vital that parents, even of kids that are difficult to parent, because these kids can be really, really challenging, finding ways to maintain positivity and optimism and praise really can upend that dynamic that leads to oppositional defined behavior and create a much more positive relationship between parent and child, even when things are rough going at times. And I would also add that besides defiance, you are really damaging your child's self-esteem. If they always hear no, Matt, you know, no, Matt, stop it, shy, you know, you know, uh, David, what's wrong with you? You do start to believe you're a bad boy and there is no medication and there is no real psychotherapy to improve your self-esteem. It's life and re rewarding experiences that um, make you feel good about yourself, you know, studying hard and passing the test, working hard and winning the race. Um, and so it, no parent wants to destroy their kid's self-esteem. And inevitably, the, these are toxic words that can be almost acidic to uh, the way we feel about ourselves. Yeah, supportive language and empowerment, right, to take out from what, what we're both, what you've both been speaking to is crucial. And to kind of speak into, lead into, I know the question that's coming up about how we can translate that, that goes on in the home. Right. So our role as parents, I also have three boys, Harold, right, um, two of whom we already are working on their ADHD and neurodivergence. Right. We, we have a, a fourth child, a daughter, two years old, don't know what's going on there yet. But we have work on that at home. But then what do we do in the school? How do we communicate and bring that over to the school, Shy? I know that's kind of where we're going with this. Mm -hmm. right? 
And so we, we need to kind of take these same concepts of support, language, and empowerment and figure out how to communicate that over into the school environment where where we as parents, we send them out to school and then for however many hours a day, we're out of control. We're, we're, we're out of the, the, the seat. So what can we do to influence those relationships? And to kind of speak to that, you know, we oftentimes hear about the formal methodologies, the IEP plan, the individualized education plan, the 504 plans, which are really crucial uh, bedrock mechanisms to try to provide uh, accommodations for our children, to try to provide uh, a framework of tailored support for our children. And again, these, these are legally binding relationships that we get into with, with our school where we create a team approach. So it's us coming up with a plan with the teachers, coming up with a plan with um, the special education providers or therapists, uh, again, along with the parents and of course, the child themselves, because we want to always keep them in mind to empower them with these approaches that we're bringing to bear. So we have to keep these formal processes in mind. We, the, you know, ourselves, if we have ADHD as parents, I do, you know, I need to be really on top of being organized and be aware and mindful of, of providing those formal structures. But then we have the non-formal aspects of communication that we must keep in mind. We have to do our best to advocate for our children by setting up those conversations with their teachers, with the uh, school counselors, making sure that our child knows that we have their back, knows that we're highlighting not only the negatives, but the positives, knows that we are collaborating on building behavioral plans in the school. So what do we do to support them in both these formal and informal ways are crucial ways of communicating, we've got your back and we're here for you, even though we know it's challenging, but we're trying to make this path one of least resistance for you. David, can I, can I ask a follow-up question? Last month, when we talked about supporting kiddos with Tourette's and tics, one of the concepts from the clinician was an elevator pitch. And basically, we wrote an elevator pitch on what a parent should tell the school. Is there a similar concept of when I come to the, to the teacher, I come to the school, again, maybe informally, is there an elevator pitch, an explanation? How do I advocate for my child in, in an effective way that, that builds empathy with the teacher? Most definitely. And it's a tailored pitch, right? Because every child is different in how they present uh, their, their neurodivergence into that space. So I think it's important for you to create, for a parent to create in a bulleted manner. So I might say to, my, you know, my elevator pitch might be something to the effect of, my child is, is strong and smart and motivated, but has challenges with sustaining their attention, uh, holding their, their hand down, uh, you know, without impulsively speaking, and, and can be emotionally reactive. We're here to support them with you. So I would state some of their top challenges and state the desire for us to be collaborative partners. I'm a big believer in the partnership language and creating this relationship between us as parents, our educators, and our children. So that would be kind of a formula of a pitch. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if you've ever if you've ever gone to visit one of your patients who has ADHD in school, and you're a blind, you know, you're the quote unquote blind observer or the observer in the back, you can't say passive observer, and you're shocked by how the teacher plays the odds. So if the teacher turns around and is writing on the board and there's some noise in the class, they turn around and immediately say, David, stop it, when it was shy, not David. And you meanwhile are sitting in the back of the room, you feel like you're picking on my patient and it happens again and again. And I, I'm telling you, at least 35 years ago, I had a, a kid up at Horace Mann and I went up to visit and the, at the time, Horace Mann only had a private school in the Bronx, had three quarter walls. I had trouble focusing because I could hear what was going on in the other class. And they were just picking on Mitchell more and more and more. And I remember coming back and seeing him you know, in my office. And I said, by the way, visit your school. And I was so proud of the way you were behaving. And I, you know, I'm going to tell you something that your parents aren't going to tell you. Your teacher is very mean. You have a mean teacher. Now, we can't do anything about it. She's just, I think, very tired and she seems very mean, but you have to understand that sometimes she says things to you and she could be wrong, but we can't do anything about it. But 25 years later, I think, 
he came back to see me when his marriage was falling apart. And I said, let me send you to a, he, he called me, he said, my marriage is falling apart. My uh, company is going bankrupt. And I said, tell me where you live and I'll give you the name of a good psychiatrist. And he said to me, I live in New York and I want to see you. I said, well, I'm a child psychiatrist. He said, but you're my child psychiatrist. And when he came in, one of the things he said to me was, I remember you told me my teacher was mean. I knew she was mean, but my parents said no. And you said yes. And they, they can't help themselves. The teachers have 25 kids in the class and, and they don't learn all the time. Today, I think educators are better at this classroom behavior because one of the things you're supposed to do is not pay attention to the shiny penny, but try to get everyone to, uh, to respond to praise, to positive praise instead of these negative in interactions. Right. So, okay, so we woke up in the morning, we went to school, now we're back at home. Of course, there's a lot of aspects to uh, to home habits and routines, but I, I want to, Matt, I want to zoom in on one of them, which I'm sure came up in the questions a ton of times. Um, can you help provide some guidelines for screen time uh, that balance the need for downtime with the potential for overstimulation uh, for these kiddos? Yeah, Shai, if, you, if you'll humor me, do you mind if I just quickly run through screen time, sleep, nutrition, and exercise? Because they're- yeah, the perfect. They're cornerstones, and I'll try to do them quickly in the interest of time. So yep. screen time. Screen time is the number one issue for every parent these days. Kids who have ADHD are particularly sensitive to the effects of screen time. They are particularly drawn into interacting with their screens. The reward systems in their brains seem particularly sensitive to the addictive qualities of screen time. And yes, screens are addictive, particularly for children particularly for children with ADHD. So it is critically important to limit the time that your kids are on screens. Um, it, I, I don't have a, a magical number of minutes or hours per day, but there's certain, certainly there's a lot of time that sound, sounds too much. The average elementary school age kid is on, has four hours a day. That sounds too much to me. The average adolescent these years, these, at this point has seven hours per day or seven and a half hours per day. That sounds like way too much for me. Um, so Limiting screen time is critically important and it's particularly important because of ADHD and it's important to start early. So not using screens as, as your only parenting device to get through cooking dinner or to get through difficult times of day is really important. I know it's challenging, but it's worth the investment. Second, I mentioned sleep before. Kids who have ADHD, all kids need sleep, but kids who have ADHD are particularly sensitive to sleep deprivation and have a hard time falling asleep. Um, so need really, really regular bedtimes need really, really regular sleep hygiene. So the same routine each night for bed. There's a great irony of all people with ADHD, kids and adults, which is that they hate routines and they need routines. Um, like that's the central paradox of, of living with ADHD. Um, and it's why kids and adults who have ADHD do great when they're in an environment that is highly structured and routinized. So, so that applies to bedtime as well. Really prioritizing sleep with your children from a young age will be really, really helpful. And you continue to, by the time that my kids are teenagers, by this age, they, they themselves appreciate how much better they feel when they get a good night's sleep and, and they prioritize it themselves. There are questions in the chat about nutrition. There's a lot of anecdotal discussion about the influence of things like sugar in the diet on ADHD. There's not good medical evidence that sugar intake is directly related to ADHD. However, every parent is the expert in their child. If you notice that your child responds to certain kinds of food with certain kinds of behavior, pay attention to that and change what you're feeding them so that they can benefit from your observations. I will say that our attention span is very sensitive to our blood sugar. And our blood sugar is maintained at an even level when we have protein throughout the day. So having protein, in, particularly in the first meal of the day, helps to stabilize blood, blood sugar throughout the day, which then helps to stabilize and improve attention span. So if you're thinking about the, your, your kids' meals across the course of the day, trying to get protein into them first thing in the, in the morning is really, really important. And then finally, the thing that I, I talk to my patients about constantly is moving their bodies, finding time for exercise for very, very active, bouncing around kids who are in preschool and elementary school, getting to school 30 minutes early and being on the playground for 30 minutes before school really helps to easing them into a, a better start to the day at school and making sure to have lots of time to exercise, particularly time outside and, and going to soccer practice as a five year old and getting in line to kick a ball once every 20 minutes is not exercise. Exercise for a five year old is unstructured free. It's running around and climbing and racing and doing things that, that allow kids to be free and expressive and creative with their bodies. That's what kids really need, who, who particularly kids who have ADHD. That's excellent, thank you. Um, you mentioned sleep, so let's, let's, let's zoom to the, uh, let's skip ahead to the end of the day. 
Um, Harold, can you give us one simple bedtime strategy that, that in your practice has been effective, proven effective in ensuring that a kiddo with ADHD gets adequate rest and actually does get to sleep? So I think sleep also needs routines. And so again, if you can start the sleep routine, maybe 30 minutes, an hour beforehand, which means we know that there's a routine. We're going to take a warm bath. We're going to brush our teeth. Um, we're going to read stories. Um, and there's going to be two books or three books and one book you can pick and one book dad likes to pick and you can pick the third book. Um, and they know there's a time limit because we're going to close the lights at eight o'clock, seven o'clock. Um, it's also not a bad time to talk about the highs of the day. Routines like that, you know, these positives, what was the best part of your day? What was the high of your day? I'll tell you what my high of the day is. Uh, you know, it's kind of like pillow talk, but so it's something that they're going to look forward to. They're going to like being, you know, in bed with mom or dad, reading a story to them, giving them undivided attention, not judging them. So if it was, they had no high and they have some lows and you don't particularly like what they're saying, you're not going to judge it. Um, those kinds of things really do work. Um, and by the way, a snack at bedtime is not bad either, but it has to be done again before the bath, before the brushing the teeth um, and, and let them have some milk or let them have, you know, um, some kind of, as Matt just said, a piece of cheese, um, some kind of, you know, protein or something that's not super sweet. But again, is a matter of I'm spending the next hour calming them down, making it easy for them. And by the way, some kids will want their back rubbed. Uh, you know, I would do that for five minutes, you know, after a while your hand falls asleep before the kid falls asleep, but, and also helping them with techniques, you know, counting backwards, you know, asking them, uh, would they like to look at a book for five minutes after you leave the room and that you'll come back and check on them. The, all of those things, the word routine comes in, it, it really does work. Do you mean? And by the way, Matt's 100% right. Structuring sleep is so important. And so that means that parents might not be able to stay out late uh, on a school night because their kids have to be in bed by seven o'clock or 7.30 or because they're going to wake up early. I mean, these are the kids who, and, and by the way, you could help your kids then the, now the young kids have traffic lights in their room. You know, if it's when they wake up and it's red, it's the middle of the night. If it's yellow, they can get out of bed, they can go to the bathroom, but they have to stay in their room. And if it's green, they know that they're, you know, they can, they're let out of jail, so to speak. But that gives them more structure uh, instead of a free-for-all. Excellent. So end of the day, we managed to get our kids to sleep. Um, I know we're all parents uh, from, from the palace here. What are some, David, what are some practical tools and, and I guess routines as well that parents and caregivers can use to manage their own mental health during or at the end of, of a day where they had to support their kid? You know, I think all parents, whether we are parents of a child with a neurodivergence such as ADHD or not, could benefit from directing attention towards ourselves. And that seems impossible at times. It seems like we don't have a minute to breathe, whether you have one child or four children or more, it seems impossible, but we must put effort in to bringing awareness to ourselves, to being mindful of ourselves. And that can be in the form of exercise, making sure we take time to take care of our bodies. It most certainly has to do with sleep, Right? We, we will give the same advice to our children that they need to sleep, so do we. We need to be cognizant of, of our energy meters and our battery. We have to recharge our battery to wake up the next day as fresh as possible to take on that day. Um, so becoming aware of these uh, practices, including mindfulness training, to, to become aware of awareness itself. You know, 20 years ago when I was, or well, 30 years ago when I was in graduate school, we never even talked about mindfulness. Now, I used to work at NYU Child Study Center, Harold, when you were there, and, and we were all there, actually, I think around the same time, Matt. And, and there was barely any buzz about mindfulness 30 years ago. But today, we know. We know how important it is to tune into our tuning in mechanisms. We have to flip off of autopilot and welcome in the co-pilot of our own minds to watch what's going on. We have to watch the gauges. Are we going into the red? If we're going into the red, we need to tap out. Sometimes we need to turn to our partner or to someone else in our social support and say, I need a break. 
I need a, 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 an hour off, a day off, or I even need to take a few, a, a little vacation. Can you tap in and help me recharge? We also need to make sure we're focusing on our own time management so that we don't create an environment for our children that is haphazard or that is um, uh, highly reactive in the moment, which again, I'm a parent with ADHD. I have to do my own work on my own ADHD so that I can have that environment that feels to my children structured, that feels dependable and reliable. And the last thing that I would, I would offer, or the last two things I would offer are to build a community of support. So for example, we know and at Agave, at Agave Health uh, and our, our platform uh, to support families and adults with ADHD, we have a community element where you can tune in to what's going on among a community and share in resources and share in the dialogue of what it's like to be a parent or an adult with ADHD. And that's crucial. And the last element is to make sure we're being aware of our communication so that we are not getting caught ourselves impulsively being too hard. Uh, we are communicating positives, as we've been saying, celebrating the wins with our children. What are the highlights, Harold said, right? What's the highlight of your day? What's the highlight of our interactions? We really need to be aware of our communications and, and that will go a very long way in helping our children. Excellent. Um, last section, and we're gonna zoom uh, right past to it. So I will have, um... One question for Harold, one question for Matt. So um, Harold, um, what are some red flags, some very clear signs that might indicate a child uh, with inattention uh, and hyperactivity might actually need professional support? I think we go back to distress and dysfunction. So um, doing very poorly at school, getting reports from school that um, he's disruptive or she seems to be lost in a cloud, um, that they're they're too energized, they're distracting to other kids, um, and that your child is telling you they don't like school, that they're finding it too hard or too boring. Boring is a famous word, um, and they're dissatisfied. The other thing that would be the other red flag is exactly what David was talking about. That if your communication with your child is you know this no Adam or don't don't do it, David, um, that you start to find that, of course, you love your child, but you don't like being with them because it's so stressful and it's so, you know, the child seems so dysregulated and you're so worried that you have to constantly keep hovering because they could do something dangerous. Those are signs, as, as far as I'm concerned, that do something about it. Remember, in the United States, on average, it takes eight years from the onset of symptoms before a parent goes and gets help. It's the most ridiculous statistic I've ever heard. It takes two weeks for a rash, and yet it takes eight years for this. This is, in my opinion, the worst thing you could do is hope for the best. This is the time where you go to get, you talk to your pediatrician, you see if they can be helpful, you go to childmind.org because it's free and scientifically sound, or you go to a mental health professional and you make sure you go to one who understands ADHD and you ask for a diagnosis. You know, the worst thing that happens is you just wasted a few hours and whether it's insurance or you wasted a few of your own dollars to be told, no, this is not ADHD. This is just an exuberant child who's super enthusiastic or is so bright that he's bored in school and maybe you need to give him some more enrichment. The best thing that could happen is that someone says to you, this is really something that we can do. You know, we could put glasses on someone who has trouble seeing and all of a sudden it becomes clear. And there's treatments that work. The, you know, the treatments which will get, you know, the medication treatments have been around since 1935 and 1955. So we can do something to really make these kids' lives as productive as possible. Yeah, I, I had a I had a great professor shot um, whose name was Dr. Kopowitz, who said, You're only eight years old once. And if you don't learn the things that you need to learn when you're eight, you're gonna be playing catch up for the rest of your life. And in kids who are really struggling with really severe ADHD symptoms who are eight years old, who are not learning how to navigate relationships on the playground and not learning how to do long division and not learning to do the things that eight-year-olds learn, it, it, it really does dig them into a hole. We can help them out of the hole. And we see plenty of kids at 10 or 12 or 14 or 24 and we, and we help them, but it's a lot easier if they, if they haven't fallen into a hole like that. Right. So Matt, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm not one of those parents who waits eight years. I want to get help. 
what can you walk us through what should I be doing as a parent? Uh, what role does my PCP play versus free resources, my school? Um, maybe mention a little bit, you know, the type of care that, that you know, you help us provide uh, at Fort Health. I'm a parent. What do I do? There, there, there are many doors to walk through to get help. Um, so let's start with a pediatrician. Pediatricians these days tend to be very well versed in ADHD and are able to have conversations and do basic diagnostic questions to help to distinguish. Is this possibly ADHD or likely not? So starting with your pediatrician is a great place to start. Um, starting with, with a trusted person at school, a teacher who knows your child well, or a guidance counselor at school, and say, hey, I'm really worried about their learning, I'm worried about their behavior. What do you think compared to other kids that you see? Do you think I should be worried? And what, what would you recommend that I do next? Um, you can go to see a mental health professional, see a psychologist, or a clinical social worker, or a child psychiatrist, all of whom have specialty training in diagnosis of ADHD using an interview, so getting a detailed history from you, the parent, getting an interview from, with the child's teacher and other adults that know the child well, and then spending time with the child and, and, and understanding their behavior, their language, um, every aspect of their presentation, and reaching diagnosis that way. Sometimes we all, we'll see a specialty psychologist called a, a neuropsychologist. When there's some difficulty making the diagnosis, there may be other complicating factors with regard to things like autism or other neurodevelopmental conditions, where it's helpful to do a full battery of formal diagnostic testing that's called neuropsychological testing. That's sometimes helpful. It's not necessary for most kids to reach a diagnosis of ADHD. And then we get to treatment and there, there are lots of treatments that are helpful and there are also lots of treatments that aren't helpful. Um, so I, mean, I think that just, just honing in on what's really helpful and I'd love David to, to help me with this. Um, Dr. Hoppels mentioned medications. Medications are safe and approved by the FDA and helpful for treating kids who have impairing ADHD symptoms. And behavioral treatments for children and for parents are helpful in addressing ADHD. So for parents learning parenting skills that are specifically helpful, for if you have a child who has ADHD, it's called parent management training. And it's a specific kind of parent coaching that you can get from a, a trained clinician. And then behavioral coaching for the child, of how can they reach their goals? How can they learn to better identify and suppress problematic impulses and keep their eye on their goals and the things that they want to achieve? and working with their parents and teachers to reward them for keeping their behaviors on track. David, what would you add? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the importance of stepping into an active role, we said before, there's some buzzwords of being both, both the advocate and the first responders on the scene is an important idea that we have to collaborate with the providers, with the therapist, with the psychiatrist, and with those in school who are uh, triaging, as it were, to support our children. And so being educated is number one. All, all of us are involved in different organizations that provide education as a starting point, whether it be in any of our websites or whether it be um, getting into uh, an office with a professional to get trained in parent training and for your own parenting skills, bringing your child to a professional to develop those behavioral modification skills and collaborating with our educators to help support all of that. And, and so again, we have to be advocates, we have to be first responders, and we have to be the triage coordinators if we wanna see effective change happen for our children. Excellent. Um, I think we are going to move um, to the Q&A section of, of the program here. Um, so I'm going to encourage the clinicians, if you see a question um, that you think would be mega relevant to everyone else, let's just go and pick these ahead. Shai, I've, I've been, I've been t trying to address some of these questions as we go in, in the chat, but I, there, there are a number of people who've asked the same question, which, which is to, for us to comment on differences in presentation of ADHD between boys and girls, um, which yes. is a really good question. Um, yeah. David, is that something that you want to want to speak to? It really depends on ages. I think it's a, when we're talking about young children, we tend to see the hyperactivity is, has been traditionally more pronounced, at least in the, in the original kind of the first wave of our understanding, we saw hyperactivity more. The boys are acting out more. It's more apparent to be able to see. Uh, and so we're, we're quick to um, assess and address based on hyperactivity, whereas uh, the, the younger girls might be more typically inattentive and we may not catch it as easily. Um, and 
those are aligned with some of what's going on. Indeed, younger uh, girls are typically more dis, um, inattentive in the presentation. I think today we're starting to see research showing a, a evening out um, in these presentations. Um, and as we get older, as children get into adolescence and young adulthood, we're also seeing that the inattentiveness really rises up and equally are presenting. Uh, I'm sure Harold might have other uh, ideas about this as well. I would tell you, I think that, uh, that it's about, it's much easier when a kid is hyperactive. I mean, that's, you know, pediatricians are good at that. Teachers are good at it. I think we should be careful very often where a girl could be more compliant and recognizes that she has to follow the rules because that's the expectation, but she is having difficulty staying focused. And I think very often parents say, well, she's just a little dizzy or she's a little cloudy. Instead of saying, wait, our expectations are the same. Uh, she's very bright when you talk to her directly and you ask her questions. How come she keeps getting lost in class? And I think uh, that's the bias, I think, that parents have toward girls and boys. And um, but, and I think they often, girls very often get lost because of this. The other thing I think we should talk about just briefly is how often this occurs with another disorder. You know, very often kids who have ADD without the H uh, also have a co-occurring anxiety disorder, which... Yeah, in the long run, every study has shown is actually protective. It's the only time in psychiatry where you have two disorders and it's better than having one because, you know, you're very impulsive. Let's get on the motorcycle. And the anxiety says, well, maybe you should put a helmet on. Oh, let's have sex. Well, I might get a venereal disease. Let's put on a condom. And and that in the long run, when Rochelle Gittleman Klein did her, you know, five-year, 10-year, 30-year, 35-year follow-ups, it was the kids who had that comorbidity that actually did better than the kids who just had ADHD. And um, again, that takes a good diagnosis, David. You know, that takes, you know, a professional who's asking the right questions. Are you worried about things? You know, what bothers you? Instead of just looking at the behavior, which is so impulsive. Uh, I think the, you know, these kids usually get more attention than anxious kids because they're squeaky. You know, they they disrupt things. The, the wonderful news about this is that this is a very treatable disorder. Uh, I think the more harsh news is that for parents, you have to be extraordinary. You know, when you have an average child, you can be a below average parent. You know, if you have an extraordinary child in any way, whether they're gifted or they have too much, uh, you know, too much activity and too little attention, you really have to have the carrots and the sticks ready all the time. And you do absolutely have to do what David says, which is tap out. And that's a great model to say to your kids, I need a, I need a timeout right now. Uh, I'll be back. Mom's in charge. And whether it's going just for a walk or a run or just for some meditation, you know, or just simple mindfulness, that really works to recharge you and then go back into the game. But I think we're, we'd have to be foolhardy and dishonest if we don't tell parents of kids with ADHD, this is more challenging than having a child who doesn't have it. The good part is it can be exceptionally rewarding because, you know, what you're doing is you're helping the kids get to all their IQ points, letting them be as focused as they possibly can, be as creative as they can. I mean, I can list 10 phenomenal human beings who've done remarkable things in the world who had ADHD, but they needed help from parents right. to get to school, you know, to, to manage through the boredom of some of the classes that they had to take. I want to. I just want to double click on that, Harold, briefly. That 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 it's important for parents to hear that 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 people who have ADHD do extraordinary things and and are overrepresented in certain kinds of work, particularly in creative fields, um, in kinds of work that require the the capacity to pay attention to multiple things at once, and where you where having a low tolerance for boredom is actually a useful thing. Um, where loving meeting different kinds of people all the time is a useful thing. Um, so people who with ADHD oftentimes do brilliantly well in sales. Um, they oftentimes do really, really well in fields that are really driven by human relationships. They often do really, really well, as I said, in creative fields. And so there's lots of reasons to be hopeful about the future. Um, and just because kids struggle in school doesn't mean that they're going to struggle all their lives. And getting them the support that they need can make all the difference around them feeling capable competent and able to master difficult things. That's going to mean much more rather than their GPA in, in, in high school over the long run. Yeah, and the good and news is that their school, I'm sorry, David, go ahead. I was just going to offer just one other 
avenue where we can learn that is in community. That's why I'm a big advocate of being a part of an ADHD or neurodivergent community because you need to you you have to get out of your own small vacuum of being able to understand the spectrum here and the upsides and the challenges and how we face those. It's very important to to um, engage in that way. So we have that hope. We have not just one side of this, but the full view of it. I'm sorry, Howard, you were going to say. No, I, I was going to say the thinking outside the box, you know, the, the people, I, I always think of the guy who started JetBlue and yeah. gave us the paperless ticket. And when you talk to Needleman, he says, I was always losing my airplane ticket. I thought <laughs> somebody else must be losing it. But who would have thought of the fact that why do we need a paper ticket? So that kind of creativity can be, to, you know, can be so worthwhile in any kind of area of, of work that needs some ingenuity, some idea to think uh, outside a straight line. And it's just a matter of helping them get through the, the difficult parts of waiting in line, raising your hand and giving them some more, you know, uh, tolerance uh, and, and more patience uh, that will get them through some of those mean teachers that I talked about. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, there were a couple of questions I keep seeing. How early can ADHD be diagnosed and treated? Um, I'll jump in and, and offer some thoughts. There's a technical answer and there's a practical, realistic answer. Um, in, a, in a practical sense, you might see signs of hyperactivity or inattentiveness as early as three years old, you might see it and 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 see a difference and begin to suspect and um, wonder perhaps there are, there is a divergence here. Technically speaking, a diagnosis though is not attained until uh, five six years old is typically I, I think on the early side of where a clinician might feel comfortable um, providing a again a technical diagnosis. Um, but, it, uh, you know, and so it, it's important if you're seeing signs to bring that child over to professionals who have a broader view of, um, of relativity. So it might be like we said, uh, you know, you, Matt said before, you might go to your pediatrician and then you might get kind of bumped up to see a mental health professional um, who can give you more of that differential uh, between what's, what's actually being presented. So I, I've seen kids as young as three who meet the diagnostic criteria, uh, but basically the treatment approach is parent management training. Um, you're becoming a better, more effective parent. Uh, medications, by the way, and I, I was the principal investigator of a trial of preschoolers uh, who had ADHD. Um, medicine works, but it has a lot more side effects in very young kids. And so the, the rule of thumb is not to medicate kids uh, under the age of four and really to wait. And why kindergarten? Because there's another, remember, there's an observer who has hundreds of uh, kids in her sample or in his sample. But I think, you know, becoming a better parent, even if the diagnosis is wrong and you just went through parent management training, it just makes you a more effective parent for the average kid as well to, you know, catch your kid being good, ignore insignificant off-task behavior, only uh, intervene when it's truly egregious or dangerous. Um, those things make everyone a better parent, not only for that child, but for your other children as well. Excellent. I think that's probably um, a good time for, for, for closing comments. Um, so, you know, I want to thank, first of all, uh, the three esteemed clinicians who joined us. Um, wonderful session. Thank you for the audience and the thoughtful questions. Apologize if you weren't able to get to everyone. Uh, on the behavioral uh, technique side, um, again, you know, uh, companies like Agave, companies like Fort Health, uh, for us, uh, treating with parent management training, treating with CBT, uh, with behavioral techniques, that is our bread and butter and first line treatment. Uh, of course, we have, and, and Dr. Bill is a child as psychiatrist, of course, we have psychiatric medication, but as a principal, and I think the clinicians would agree here, psychotherapy is the gold standard first-line treatment, no matter what your child has. And a treatment should never only consist of medication. So please visit uh, childline.org for some great resources. Uh, if you're in uh, New Jersey or New York, uh, forthealth.com, uh, we're here to help you uh, with insurance-based care. And we will be sending a recording. That's probably the most common question. We will be sending out a recording of the session 
to everyone who registered. It's going to be on our website. Please share. And uh, thank you again, and we'll see you next month. We have a session on social media and screen time. Thanks very much. Thanks again, thank clinicians. You. Bye -bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye.